hearing about a little bit later. And uh, we always appreciate the staff and the press being with us. At this time, we'll ask Mr. Miller if he will lead us in the invocation and Mr. Zayo in the pledge of allegiance. Good morning, Madam Chairman and members of the board. It's my honor today to share with you the school board's resolution to honor our business partners in our community through the SBA. And our resolution today reads, the school board of Henry County in regular session on Thursday, the 2nd of April, 2015, unanimously adopts the following resolution in recognition of the valuable partnership of Nelson Auto Group, Martinsville Speedway, and Eastman Chemical Company. Whereas public schools and local businesses are an integral part of this community, and whereas many local businesses play a crucial role in supporting our schools, and whereas collaboration between local public schools and local businesses strengthens schools and the business community alike by providing a well-trained and highly educated workforce, and whereas an excellent public school system is vital to the quality of life in this community, and fundamental to preserving a strong democratic society now and in the future, now therefore be it resolved that the Henry County School Board names Nelson Auto Group, Martinsville Speedway, and Eastman Chemical Company to the 2015 Virginia School Boards Association Business Honor Roll, showing appreciation for the firm's ongoing support of this community's public schools. Your work has aided this community in focusing on the goal of providing the best public schools we can for every child who attends them. And this morning, I'm proud, Madam Chairman, to have Mr. Barry Nelson come forward and accept for Nelson Auto Group. Nelson has generously donated three cars for three months to our Teacher of the Year program for several years, and they have done so again this year. Additionally, they spend a lot of time and dollars supporting our athletic programs and bringing motivational speakers in for our students each year. So we thank them very much for that. Also this morning, we're grateful to Martinsville Speedway. The Speedway provides reading incentives for our students through a program where students can earn race tickets for reading. They also collaborate with Rich Acres Elementary's Go Far Club, and you probably saw in the newspaper recently that that club had the privilege of running at the Speedway with Jimmy Johnson, but the club also practices at the Speedway, which is a privilege for them. And the Speedway also generously donated two tickets for each representative of our Teachers of the Year. So we appreciate them for all that they do for us as well. Okay.
And last but not least this morning, Pat Calderera from Eastman Chemical Company is here to accept on their behalf. Eastman has begun a math leaps program with our teachers. And this is a program that they traditionally run in the summer through Tennessee colleges, and they invite teachers to that program. They have extended that invitation to our teachers. But to give our teachers a taste of that and what they might experience while there, Eastman brought that program to our teachers a few months ago, and they benefited greatly from that particular partnership. Eastman is also very active in our community by supporting Engineers Week and sending their engineers out to work with our students. They help to um, encourage their engineers to mentor local robotics teams, which they do very actively. They are part of the MIX participation event through the EDC, and they support our athletic and music programs in our schools through dollars. Additionally, they provided donations for our Teachers of the Year this year as well. So we'd like to thank Mr. Calderera. Good morning, ma Madam Chairman and members of the board. Uh, what you have in front of you um, is the first reading of the Code of Conduct. There's just some minimal changes in it. Um, as you look through it, anything in red will be some new inserts. There are a few cross-outs and a few things that I just wanted to highlight. Throughout the Code of Conduct, you'll see some clarification on search and seizure. That will be put in the, in the back of the definitions as well as when you're looking at students' personal belongings and electronic devices. That's been put in there. Uh, we clearly defined excused absences. Um, there were some questions exactly what that meant as well as defining bus stop. Um, in the chemical abuse section, you will see where uh, we did include synthetic substances because our synthetic substances do provide um, the students are using them, and it is causing harm. It's a safety risk. So we wanted to make sure that that was included. Um, this year, the Bring Your Own Technology guidelines are included in the Code of Conduct for those who are allowed to um, have that in their schools. And then the tobacco-free school section, we simplified that. It's still, yeah, we, want, we want our schools to be tobacco-free but there were a lot of steps and it was causing some confusion, so we met with the principals and we simplified. But that would be the gist of the changes if anyone has any questions.
fell out first, second, and fence, not every situation is the same. Right. And then when, when you use your judgment based on the severity of the situation, then from time to time we'll have parents that will say, says, first offense or second offense, and then we can get into a discussion about why this particular offense uh, led to more of Yes, sir. Um, how we have it and how we've handled with the schools, if a child is out sick, um, we do have children that have viruses, um, and they may call into the school, and they may say, okay, my child's got a fever of 100, and it um, seems to be the stomach virus that's going around, and um, we'll see how it goes. And um, that's a verified absence. Verified absences are absences that may end up being an excused absence at some point or may not. But it's the responsibility of the school to mark the reasons why the parents are calling in and why it's verified because there is space to put details in because it falls under compulsory attendance. At some point, if a student misses five days that are not excused and the principal starts having concerns that I'm not sure the validity of these, I may need to have a conference. And an attendance contract meeting, let's chat, let's talk about what's going on. The parent at that conference says, my child was sick, you know, I took him to the doctor. I failed to bring you a note. Not a problem. That we can go back and retroact and change that any time. If the child continues to miss, we start having issues because it is a requirement that the child has so many hours of instruction. So we as a school division have to look to ensure are the children getting the hours of instruction they need in order to progress to the next grade level? 
children in um, elementary middle schools who miss up to 20 days in a year have to be or looked at considered for retention due to the lack of instruction. Um, in high schools, we look at 10 absences in a semester because we're on block scheduling. And we have found in the past that sometimes parents will say, I'm sick, or there's a note called in, I'm sick, and it, the parent had no knowledge. Someone else called in for someone. So if it becomes an issue of truancy because there's other things going on, I have had some doctors call because this parent all of a sudden wants excused absences for days and, and wants to, they want to see the whole printout for where they are and are calling the doctors asking for excused absences. Um, so I, from a medical standpoint, I understand your concern. If a child is a verified absence and has the virus, and that principal says this is not someone that has developed in a pattern of every Thursday and Friday, that would not be a referral for court. Yeah, so for clarification purposes, where this really becomes an issue is the children who are, as you said, becoming truancy issues. Yes, sir. But during flu season and when there's a stomach bug going around, for the kids that don't miss a lot, they aren't going to have an issue not having a doctor's note. Yes. yes. I was going to say that's, that, that's the short answer. Um, if it's a verified absence, the only time that it could become an issue is if they miss several days and then we have to look at the reason for the absence. Even in elementary students, they will. Even elementary students are bringing these to school, sir. Good morning, Madam Chairman and members of the board. I'm here today to ask you for the approval of the Carl D. Perkins grant for 2015-16. The 
purpose of this grant is to increase focus on the academic achievement of career and technical education students, to strengthen connections between secondary and post-secondary education, and to improve state and local accountability. It is estimated that Henry County Public Schools will receive $162,000 $48.53. This is based on last year, this year's allocation. Actual awards will not be made until September 2015. At that time, we will know exactly how much we will receive, and this is 100% reimbursable. The Perkins Grant will support the CTE programs and assist in providing as many hands-on experiences as possible for all the program areas including agricultural education, marketing, business and information technology, technology, family and consumer science, trade and, and industrial education sciences, health and medical sciences. Our decisions to allocate these funds is also rooted in our strategic plan. Specifically, this grant will support goal one, high quality instruction, goal two, high quality professionals, and goal four, innovative and cutting edge technology. We plan to use the funds as follows. To support continuous professional development for our career and technical teachers. This is a requirement of the Perkins Grant. We plan to use funding to provide CTE teachers the opportunity to participate in local and state conferences and to be familiar with curriculum updates and current trends. Conferences provide time for teachers to collaborate and develop strategies to increase the number of students who earn industry certifications, which is now a graduation requirement, beginning with the 2013-14 freshman class. A CTE completer is a student who has met the requirements for a CTE concentration or sequence in all requirements for high school graduation or an approved alternative education program. Last year, we had 349 students who were completers and 208 students earned an industry certification. We plan to spend about $16,875 to support our teachers in this area. We are also pleased to announce that during the 2015-16 school year, we have plans to partner with Patrick Henry Community College and their fabrication lab to assist us in starting an intro course for our middle schoolers at both middle schools. Those instructors, our teachers, will receive training from the PHCC Fab Lab instructors. We plan to purchase materials and training that our students and teachers will need to begin this program at both middle schools. Teachers will need supplies such as 3D printers, a vinyl cutter, lasers, and professional development. This class will prepare our students for the Project Lead the Way engineering classes in our high schools. Our students will use programming and coding to program and code computers to fabricate machines to program and compute, compute I'm sorry, program and code machines to fabricate using wood, metal, and vinyl, and it will help them prepare for college and career. We're excited about our partnership with PHCC, and they will provide training for our teachers on this. The plan also addresses our goals to increase the number of special population students enrolled in CTE courses and meets our required spending of the Perkins funds Special population students include students identified as special needs, economically disadvantaged, limited English proficiency, and non-traditional students. Non-traditional students are determined based on gender and enrollment in specific courses. Examples would be a male enrolled in health and medical sciences or the early childhood program, or a female enrolled in the Project Lead the Way or the HADVAC classes. We can use Perkins funds to assist paying for travel and expenses for special population students only. Perkins no longer can pay for all student travel, just those students who are eligible under the special populations requirement. That's a new, that's new and that just recently changed in December. This year we are also focusing on increasing the number of limited English proficiency students enrolled in our CTE courses. We provide translators to inform middle school and high school students and parents about the importance of enrolling in CTE courses. The program of studies has also been translated and we will provide translators at curriculum events. We plan to spend about $1,500 of the Perkins Fund to support this initiative. 
We will also continue to update equipment and technology, which speaks to goal four of providing innovative and cutting edge technology. For the Project Lead the Way curriculum, we will purchase software licenses for multi-STEM and STEM bundles needed to enhance Project Lead the Way classes at our high schools. We will also purchase ADA software, which is needed as well. This, will estimate, this estimated cost is about $6,000. And we will also purchase a new welding simulator that is needed, about $5,000. And as I said earlier, we are going to start up fab labs at both of our middle schools. So we will use $57,550 to get those labs started. And once again, this will um, assist students with programming and coding to program the computers that program the machines to um, allow students to fabricate using wood and vinyl and metal. We are partner partnering with PHCC on this. And we will use the funds to, to buy 3D printers, a vinyl cutter, laser, software, and to support the professional development needed. The health and medical sciences clusters will be benefit from strong computer skills and an understanding of the important connection between healthcare and technology. We will purchase the annual software upgrades needed for the health and medical science classes, as well as an LCD projector. The greenhouse at Magna Vista is also in need of technology upgrades. We plan to use about $10,000 of our Perkins funds to assist in upgrading the technology needed for the students and the teachers participating in the horticultural program. Each year, the software that our business and information teachers use in their classrooms requires updating, so we plan to use about $2,500 to purchase the needed software updates. And during the 2015-16 school year, all four business labs at the high schools will receive replacement desktops. This will use about $51,750 of the Perkins grant. So once again, the total expenditures for the 2015-16 Perkins grant is estimated to be at $162,048.53. These funds are 100% reimbursable. Therefore, I am asking the board for final approval of the Perkins grant. Are there any questions? Yes, I will. Yeah, let me go back to that. Your question is about what is a special well, population student? Yeah, or? And what, what portion of the funds, uh, and what role does that play here? Okay. Um, Perkins grants used to pay for all student travel for competitions and conferences. They would let us use that money. In December, we received a notification from the Department of Education. We can no longer do that. We can only support students who fall under special populations and pay for their travel. So the special populations just refers to reimbursement for travel only, or does that apply to other parts of the program? Or? We can only reimburse travel for these students, okay. yes. That and way, I, I'm not... No, the recruitment to use it for... Oh, yeah, we can use it to try to recruit. We want to increase the number of students who are special populations in our classrooms, and we try to do that, too, yes. So that doesn't refer to the entire grant. No, 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 not at all. A portion of the grant can be used to and support that area. For special population was essentially males who are going into a traditionally female health and medical, and then you said that would be one part of a special population. What are some of the other? Yes. I mean, is this strictly a gender thing? That's no. Special population? No, that's a good question. All those the, are the examples you gave. That's yes. What all the students who are a special population fall under those categories. Our students who spe with special needs are consider considered special population students, students who are economically disadvantaged, students who are limited English proficiency, and then there's the non-traditional students, which is what you are referring to. You know, that's non-traditional, like you said, the male in a health and science, that's typically, you know, females oftentimes take the nursing classes as opposed to a male. And the DOE provides its guidelines on which students are considered non-traditional and which are not. That's a good question. Special yeah. needs students would encompass any students that have an individual instruction plan. Yes. Yes. So this just seems odd. So this is just a portion of the grant that <coughs> now has been essentially earmarked only for special populations. However, the rest of the grant applies to anybody in the right. It used to pay for all students, but now they say they can only pay for these students so to travel. Is there rationale given for why it used to pay for all of them? Now they're saying only... My understanding is I think that the federal government was audited through the Virginia Department of 
education and how they use the Carl Perkins grant. And that was the direction that was given to them after their audit, and then, then it was passed down to the locality. We've been allowed to take travel for years um, through our, our state approval. And then, like I said, they, our state was audited, which is happening with other federal programs too, like Title I and Title Three and other things. But um, they told us that we could no longer uh, use it for travel for all students. And the, the sad part of this was we found out in December It did cause some issues. And this is hurting our um, CTE students that um, have won these competitions and need to go to California and wherever. Uh, they work very hard to do this, and it really pains me that um, they're not able to uh, fund this kind of That's thing anymore. Great. Right. It's kind of intuitive to the stated goal of the grant. Because everybody yeah. can't be, you know, other. winning programs. We have award-winning programs here in Henry County. Exactly. And we need to keep having those programs. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you for your question. Yes, sir. What determines the amount of money we make? Uh, Kayla will find for each year. I'm not sure. That, do you know, Ms. Trayer? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. They just tell me how many. Actually, how much the amount is determined by state. Yeah, so determined. Oh, no, no. They tell me this is how much you get. <laughs> yes. And have we even gotten received confirmation yet? No. Um, what we're doing is we're basing our proposal on level funding, what we've received in the past. If, if we find out it's less than that, then obviously we'll make adjustments and share that with the board. But, but in order to meet the timeline, we have to plan for what we think we're going to receive. Yeah, that number there is based on this current allocation. So we just go from there. I move we approve the Carl B. Perkins Federal and State Local Plan and Budget for Career and Technical Education for student Second. It has been moved and seconded to approve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank For the 2015 school year, the school system voted to switch from fully insured to self-insured, continuing with Anthem, Blue Cross, and Blue Shield. At that time, we continued to use the fully insured rate. Um, since there was only a slight difference between that rate and the proposed mature rate at the maxi maximum aggregate stop loss level, a mouthful. The proposed increase this year is minimal at the maximum aggregate stop loss level. Our current employee rate for the employee only plan is $618.26, and the proposed rate for 2016 is $621.89, a difference of $3.63. As the rate increase is minimal, we propose to maintain the rates as a 2015 fully insured rate with no increase. And we have to keep in mind also that out of, usually out of five years, we have one high claim year, and so far we've had about six good claim years. So we are due for a high claim year. Anthem also has a standard provision that employers must contribute at least 50% of the premium on behalf of retirees. For Anthem, 
for 2016 is willing to continue to waive that provision as long as we pay 100% of the single subscriber premium for the active employees. It's recommended that the coverage be continued with Anthem for the period of July 1st, 2015 through June 30th, 2016, and that the school system continue paying 100% of the single subscriber premium for our active employees. rates for our retirees and the active employees have historically been the same rate. Oh, okay. We actually have a, a blended rate right. from the retirees and, and with the active employees. How many retirees do we have still participating? I, I don't have the number with me. <laughs> Morning, Madam Chair, members of the school board. The uh, bids were solicited for installing a security uh, window film on um, <clears throat> the main entrance areas of Bassett High School, Magna Vista, the Bill of Collinsville, Laurel Park, and Drew Mason. This is all part of the Virginia Department of Education School Security Equipment Grant. Of the four firms responding, Clearview, Clearview Glass and Tinning actually provided the lowest bid. However, they would elected to pull their bid due to some missed information. So the next lowest bidder was Commercial Window Shield of Taylor, South Carolina. So it's recommended that we would award this bid to Commercial Window Shield of Taylor, South Carolina in the amount of $22,240. And it's important to note that $16,680 of that would be paid for as part of the um, uh, school security equipment grant and then the $5,560 from our current operation maintenance budget. This film actually, it will lay, um, uh, create a, a little bit more of a secure barrier when you bust through a glass, if you will. Uh, the, glass we, uh, the glass that we use uh, doesn't come apart, it shatters, but, but this film will kind of, I guess, kind of delay that entering, if you will. If somebody was to try to bust through a glass of the front door, this film is going to delay that, and it kind of holds the, the glass into the frame a little bit uh, easier on it. So it, it, it's a good protective covering, if you will. Yes, sir. What happened was they, um, uh, when we called this bidder, um, on the day, they realized that they had left out some of the doors that we had asked for. So this was the only firm that missed those information. So we had to go to the next lowest bid. That's why they had to lower the cost. Right. And, and we give them an opportunity of certainly we'd like for them to, to, to install it at a cost. But uh, we also understood if they missed something as part of the procurement, they can pull their bid within 24 hours. So is this, is this window film part of? It, it's, it's should be standard. not part of the standard notion. We applied for this grant uh, with this window film uh, because this is something that we've been talking about wanting to do, and so we would used the opportunity of the grant to pay for this. On and we have looked at the possibility of um, bulletproof or or some film or glass that we could investigate, and and because uh, we do have a lot of glass that you know in our buildings that provide that protection. Barrier, and essentially, what this will do is it'll just buy some more time. So, right. 
And, and we've got some great video I can share with you on it that um, uh, kind of gives you some good demonstrations of how this works. Chair, I have our, our highlight report from March that I'll have to this year. All the great things that are happening in our schools. Uh, the first one, the Parent University. Parents at Axton Elementary School attended their first Parent University in March. The opening session featured a student choir and internet safety mini course by Lieutenant Troy Easter in the back there and Captain Eric Wynn. Following the opening session, parents had a choice of one breakout session on topics such as fitness and couponing and academic sessions hosted by Axon's teachers and staff. Susical, Campbell Court Elementary hosted a Dr. Seuss night on March 2nd. Students and their families retreated to story time featuring some of Dr. Seuss's most beloved stories, games, door prizes, and a door decor, or say, judging contest. Votes for Keats, members of the Martinsville Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority uh, visited Consul Primary recently. Each preschooler in Christy Hollins and Robertson's classes uh, was allowed to select a book to take home and keep. When the students learned that they could actually keep the book, they cheered and clapped. Additional books were donated to be given to the preschoolers at John Red Smith Elementary. Kebabs. Three Mason Elementary School fourth graders enjoyed using marshmallows and fruit roll-ups to make cat and a hat kebabs for Dr. Seuss's birthday in March. They enjoyed the snacks while writing about a time when they were thing one or thing two mischief makers. By the way, Dr. Seuss's birthday is a big deal in elementary school, as, as you can tell. Honoring cancer survivors, fourth and fifth grade service club members at GW Carver Elementary helped to design and decorate bags that will be presented at the American Cancer Society Survivor Dinner. This event will honor cancer survivors in the Martinsville and Henry County area. The bags will be filled with gift items for each honoree. Service club sponsor, Corey Middleton, and Relay for Life team captain, Lisa Hubbard, coordinated this project. Are the odds in your favor? Fifth grade students at John Red Smith have been exploring the idea of probability. They tested out the odds by rolling dice against each other and tracking the results through a graphing activity to see whether odd or even is in the most often. Reading is a family affair. Kindergarten teachers met with parents and students at Sandville recently to discuss the importance of reading and strategies to help their children become great readers. Families made reading games to take home and had ice cream sundaes to celebrate Dr. Seuss's birthday, of course. Uh, paying it forward by the hundreds. Stanley Town staff and students marked the 100th day of school uh, as a day for all to serve their community and learn the value of giving back and paying it forward. The Community Dream Center, a nonprofit outreach dedicated to helping Martinsville, Henry County, and the surrounding areas, was chosen as a recipient. Stanley Town Elementary began a two-week toiletry collection drive on the 100th day of school. By the end of the project, students and staff had collected four large boxes, each with well over 100 items of needed toiletries that would be used within our community. Choices. Garrett Dillard recently addressed the students of Laurel Park Middle School on choices and the results of decisions made by important African Americans. Mr. Brandon Johnson, a Laurel Park teacher, outlined contributions made by important African Americans, including the members of the Greensboro Four. Sixth grader Kendall Motley read My Angelo's I Know Why the Cape Bird Sings, and eighth grader Rico Dalton portrayed Muhammad Ali for citing I Am Cassius Clay. The Lower Park Choir and staff ended the assembly by singing the African American anthem. Host of state leaders, all seven Bassett High School hosts of competitors were state finalists at the recent state leadership. FFA's three-peat. Alyssa Motley and Magna Vista FFA placed second in this year's National FFA T-shirt design competition, which is based on popular vote. The group was placed in the top six in the T-shirt design contest for three years in a row. Congratulations are in order for the following people. 
Exabyte Challenge complete, not all of it's Heather Langford and her students are planning collaborative projects as they begin using the Apple TV she won and the Exabyte Challenge. The winning team, Amy Elliott's class and John Red Smith was excited to learn that they would benefit from Mrs. Elliott's work to complete the Exabyte Challenge. The students can't wait to begin sharing their work using this new addition to their classrooms technology. In Exabyte Excitement, John Red Smith's Mary Beth Martin was excited to receive the Apple TV she won in the Exabyte Challenge recently. Her excitement was infectious. She has motivated several of her colleagues to complete the challenge as well. And this is just a way that we encourage the use of technology where our teachers uh, enter this competition and they win this great technology for their classroom. And what we hoped would happen is starting to happen. Other teachers want this technology in their classroom and they're um, submitting lesson plans using technology so that they can win their uh, Apple TV as well. Instruction prize delivery. Staff and students at CCL were excited to accept the delivery of the document camera they won for their soup can flag and the can instruction competition. They're already planning ways to use technology in various devices. Technology leaders. Longwood University's Institute for Teaching Through Technology and Innovative Practices, part of Southside Virginia Regional Technology Consortium, presented awards to three Henry County Public School employees recently. Maxman's Michelle Ashworth received the Technology Teacher Award. Janet Copenhaver was honored as the SBRTC Technology Leader of the Year. And Technician Urban Bentz was recognized with the Technology Support Award. So quite a, quite a showing for Henry County there. Uh, teacher of the Year, John Rose Smith Elementary's Amy Elliott is the Henry County Public Schools Teacher of the Year. I know many board members were able to attend that great event last week. And we look forward to supporting Mrs. Elliott as she competes for Regional Teacher of the Year. Now, Madam Chairman, members of the board, this completes my highlights for, for March. I have other items in my reports that are standard items we have each month. Be glad to answer any questions you have about those. But other than that, that completes my report for this month. still working out the details. Literally, we just found out about, uh, we heard it might happen, I want to say just as early as late as last week, we found out that it was going to happen. Um, the, the piece that we need to define is what are extenuating circumstances and how do we schedule that in because you have to provide remediation uh, before they take it uh, the second time and that's going to be a very tight window for us. But what we are encouraged by the opportunity students, because any student can have a bad day when they take a test and if they, um, and the standard error measurement on those assessments um, could indicate that any given day they could get a different score within a certain range. So um, we're, we're planning on moving forward with that and we will share more as we learn more, but we just, we just found out that that was approved last week. that are affected by my budget. 
the BSBA and also of course the Blue Ridge Regional Conference that will be held here in the district. Madam Chair, I'll just second that the BSBA Hot Topics Conference School Design and Construction. Mm -hmm. Since we are hoping to build a new school, perhaps that would be beneficial for the board to attend that. today in the first one. Madam Chair, we'll need to certify the closed session. We need to certify the closed session. I'm sorry, <laughs> I know it's you. <laughs> Thank you. Whereas the school board of Henry County is committing a public meeting on this day, pursuant to an affirmative recorded vote in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, whereas section 2.2-3712.B of the Code of Virginia requires the certification of this school board that some such meeting is conducted in conformity with Virginia law. Now therefore be it resolved that the school board of Henry County hereby certifies that to the best of each member's knowledge, when in public business matters, lawful exemptions and open meeting requirements by Virginia law were discussed, and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion by which the closed meeting was convened were heard, discussed, or considered. Reverend Alter? Yes. Dr. Duvall? Yes. Ms. Madden? Yes. Motion coming out related to personnel reports. Uh, 
Uh, Madam Chairman, I move the approval of the personnel report and the personnel report addendum as presented. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the personnel report and the personnel report addendum. All in favor, please raise your right hand. Thanks. Our last issue coming from the executive session is land acquisition for our new elementary school. Madam Chairman, I move that the school board approve an option contract for the purchase of real property between Jesse and Christine Cahill and the Henry County School Board. Second. It has been moved and seconded to do the, um, what do we call it? Option. Execute the option. Uh, Execute the option for the land purchase from the Cahills. All in favor of the motion, please raise your right hand. Thank you. Madam Chairman, on, for the record, we have a copy of that for the press. Is that correct, Dr. Cotton? Yes, sir. We have a copy for Mr. Collins. 